Hello and welcome to 18 WJTS Inform. As we are joined today by State Senator Mark Mesmer, who usually comes in uh, on Fridays through the legislative session, and, and really legislation has ended Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a show today, and you'll come back again next week to kind of wrap some things up again. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, but uh, welcome back to the show. Great to be here. So we wrapped up about 11.30 p.m. Wednesday night. It was a uh, Two nights in a row or two evenings that we ran you know, pretty long to try to get out of there, trying to get out ahead of the Big Ted tourney, which has now been canceled yes, anyway. So, so now oh, you're well. free. That's right. All right. Well, let's talk about some of the big, big things that uh, kind of concern people as a whole that have happened uh, sure. in, in the Senate and the House. Yep. Going into session, we had as our Senate priorities and the House priorities were you know, pretty similar. Uh, we wanted to... to uh, deal with the change in test scores, the I, I step to I learn, and the recalibrating of the, I mean, the baseline of the test scores. So that was the first bill we passed out of the House and Senate this year, was Senate Bill 2. And it, it um, took away, it put a two-year pause on, on allowing those test scores to impact you know, a, a school's grades. And, and uh, that one was done within the first couple weeks of session. Glad to have that one taken care of. Uh, we promised the schools last year after the changes in the tests were done that that's what we do. The second big bill we passed was uh, House Bill 1007, and at the end of last year's fiscal year that ended on June 30, we had about 300 million more come in, you know, over that biennium than we anticipated, and we had about 300 million dollars worth of of college uh, level projects that we had approved in the budget that were going to be paid for with bonds, you know, some 20 year, some 25 year. Uh, payment bonds, and rather than pay, you know, rather than borrow money to pay for those with bonding, we we took that extra money, and and paid cash for those projects to where you know so it'll save about 135 million in interest costs over that 25 year period. So, uh, in the long run, it'll it'll free up money every budget cycle for you know for extra cash flow you know every year after this, and uh, was a good fiscally uh, responsible thing to do. Some folks said, "Well, why don't we just use that to increase our, you know, increase our base budget?" Well, then you've got 300 million more kind of locked in forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to cut it later, um, so we thought it'd be much more appropriate to use it for one-time expenses. Because you really don't know what's going to happen. Year well, no, and, and especially and with change, especially with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, how's that going to impact, you know, over the next year or two our economy? It'll have an impact, and and, and we sure don't know now what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third big objective we had was was you know tackling a broad range of, of issues in the medical uh, cost arena. So we had several House and Senate bills that started, uh, and and a lot of them just got ended up getting combined into. We had a, a Senate Bill Five that dealt with some of the issues. House Bill One Thousand Four dealt with some of the issues. Um, so, you know a lot of those just got merged into single you know single larger bills. But the uh, biggest focus this year was transparency in, in what's driving cost, uh, more information to patients so they can see what things are going to be, you know, before they get a procedure done, you know, make, making medical providers, you know, disclose that in advance. Uh, so one of the, one of the issues we want everybody, you know, anybody who's going to have an elective procedure, uh, you, you know, when you have that scheduled with your medical provider with, within five days, you know, before that, they have to disclose with you know to you in advance what the costs are going to be, uh, and and one of the big uh, surprises you know that folks get is you know normally the way the process works now is you file your claims, you know you end up you get some in network provider coverages and then you get out of network you know providers that ends up with what they call surprise bills, so you know you thought you had eighty twenty coverage you thought you knew what your deductibles and things were going to be. You end up with a whole battery of maybe specialists within a hospital that aren't in network and and don't get the you know don't get paid the same reimbursement rates as as the in network providers and you end up with you know hundreds or thousands of dollars of, of extra expenses so the medical providers have to disclose that in advance you have to sign off on it that you you know knew it you know and aware of it if they don't provide that to you. Then those out-of-network providers can't collect any more than what you would have gotten, you know, from your in-network in rates. So, uh, kind of puts a cap on, you know, some of those um, surprise billing situations. And and when you know in advance, you know that you've got a, you know, they're going to pr 
proposed to use an out-of-network doctor or specialist, at least gives you the you know the opportunity to you know to go somewhere that has all in-network you know services provided, or you know um, work with that out-of-network provider ahead of time on you know on rates. I mean anything you can do to help you know get get you know more advanced notice to patients the better. So does that give you kind of an opportunity to shop sure. around? Yeah, as they've exactly. Been saying? Exactly. Okay. Yes. So the second uh, the second part of of, of these bills was. Uh, Developing what they call an all pay, all payer claims database, so every provider, you know, and this will take a little time to accumulate it, but every every medical provider will have to, and we'll have to have a website or a, a system set up by state government to collect all that, aggregate it, and so you'll know what every you know over time you'll know every provider of you know in the healthcare system what their average cost is for every procedure they you know that you know every range of procedures that that, that you know that they offer, and here again just giving you more. You know more access to data to shop, you know, uh, wisely for your, you know, for your services. Um, but you know that'll probably take a lot of states have that. I think uh, 30 states have that current process in place. So that, I mean that'll be one that we aggregate over time. Um, and and having I mean you know the, so disclosing to patients in advance, getting the all cl all claims uh, payer database set up over time, you know all those should help drive competition into the system. Um, one of the areas we ended up pulling back this year, you know, only for this year, was what they called site of service billing. They say, what the heck is that? Well, you know, if, if all of the all of the, the medical providers in a in a, a hospital network are are now all employees of you know of the hospital, regardless of where that procedure happens, you know, it, it could all get billed out as if it happened, you know, in a patient room or in a surgery room at the hospital. And those costs are, are higher than for an out of you know for an outpatient facility or a doctor's office, uh, but there was a lot of resistance because there's there's changes coming up in the Medicaid and Medicare world on on how those same you know side of service billings and forms, and and the federal processes are are due to to make go through some changes this year, so out of fear of making it maybe. A screwed up paperwork mess, <laughs> and have to deal with it later. And, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna you know let the federal you know changes and those forms you know get implemented this year, and then next year we're gonna come back and 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 tackle that issue a little more a little more broadly. Uh, one of the concerns that uh, you know we had was you know having unintended consequences and and you know throwing too many changes into the system um, you know too quickly. But we're not giving up. We're just gonna. You know, dig in a little deeper to that next session. Uh, another driver into into healthcare costs is what they call gag clauses. So you know, if I, as the employer, hire Anthem to be my insurance company for my employees, um, they had clauses in their contracts between the hospital and Anthem that they were that the hospital w was prevented from you know prohibited. From sharing cost data to me, you know, either either through Anthem to me, so those were called gag clauses, and and how can you, as the the you know ultimate purchaser of that insurance, you know, you, at the end of the year, if you if you don't know what your claims were, the cost of those claims, you know, how do you know you're buying your you know your insurance, uh, you know, cost effectively, if you don't know, I mean, if you know what they're charging, but you don't know what the claims were. So you know, prohibiting gag clauses in insurance contracts will be, in, you know, over time, allow employers who provide that insurance uh, better access to the data, you know, on on and and let you shop more wisely and and see what you know see what procedures are costing you and and, and then find ways to you know to tackle those costs. Um, another big area that you know it was a start point this year. There's a group of Middle layer administrators called pharmacy benefit managers, and most people probably don't really, you know even know they're out there. But Ex Ex Express Scripts uh, is one of the national companies owned by, and it's kind of odd that the large pharmacy chains end up being you know are the owners of these pharmacy benefit managers, you know. So it's like a layer that's kind of sandwiched between the pharmacy you know, retail outlet. The pharmaceutical companies—they're—they're they're kind of a middle layer in there. That's to to, to date, are really—I mean—they are completely unregulated. 
So we're going to require those pharmacy benefit manager companies to be licensed by Indiana. We're going to require them to, to, to turn over to the Indiana Department of Insurance every year, you know, what the discounts were that they got from, you know, the pharmacy companies, pharmaceutical companies, and how those rebates, you know, got passed back to the, you know, to the, to the payer of that plan. If at all. If at all, because to date, most of them don't. Okay. Um, and then another little dirty little secret, if you have independent pharmacies like we have Sheldon's here, mm -hmm. there's other small, you know, Meyer retail, you know, grocery retail outlet. I mean, people that are independent pharmacy chains, they, those pharmacy, those PBMs, pharmaceutical benefit managers, have maximum allowable reimbursements that they, that they pay to those, you know, those non, non-chain, you know, independent pharmacies and can price them out of business. They say, well, we're only gonna give you $10 for that to reimburse you, reimburse you for that drug. And, and they might say, well, I can't buy it for less than 20. And, and the PBM could have just said, nope, you, know, you can get it for 10, so that's all you're getting. And you know, that was costing you know, the Meyer chain $40 million last year in, in lost reimbursements you know, from the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical benefit manager companies. So, require, and so what we set up in here is an appeal process that the independent pharma can, pharmacy can say, hey, they told me they're only going to you know, pay me this. I can't buy it for any less than that. And, and then let the Department of Insurance you know, mediate those, you know, those claims and require the PBM to pay them what it actually costs to provide that, that prescription. So another little piece of that, um, there was a lot of... A lot of Medical providers had um, non-compete clauses that they required doctors to sign, which really prevented doctors from moving from you know one community location to another. Um, the any doctor going forward, if you're going to have a going to have a non-compete clause, you know, preventing them from leaving to go to another another area to serve a community, you have to give doctors the ability to buy that that, that non-compete clause out, so it allow you know, more transitioning and, and, you know, movement of medical providers at, at all layers of, of, the, of the medical system, uh, you know, just to keep people from getting uh, locked out. And if they, if they leave that employer, they'd be forced to go out of state many times. Um, and uh, a little, another little piece in, in House Bill 1207, if, if you can find a prescription cheaper using WebRx or some of the different apps than what your normal, in, you know, insurance coverage would, would allow for the prior to this bill passing, if if I if my insurance benefit said it's going to cost me fifty and I could buy it for twenty five from WebRx, you could do that, but that money would never apply to your deductible. Well, as of you know House Bill twelve oh seven going into place, if you can buy it cheaper on your own than what the PBM is supposedly saving you money, you know through your health insurance company, they have to allow that that. Ind ind individual who buys that on their own and saves money to apply to your deductible and your copay. Um, and the last piece, we had uh, Senate Bill 184 that allows sole proprietors, typically the group that brought this to us was, you know, the Farm Bureau. They have, you know, farmers who might be a farmer and one employee. There is no medical plan available for groups that small. So Senate Bill 184 will allow anybody that's a sole proprietor, you'd have to join Farm Bureau, you know, for $30, $35 a year, whatever it is, but anybody that's a sole proprietor, farmer, or other small employer can, can buy their uh, medical coverage through, through Farm Bureau that gives them a much more cost competitive way to get their insurance. Which is really tough for small people. It is, yeah, impossible. Small businesses. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for coming in mm -hmm. uh, and getting us up to date on what I guess this what is, people will consider the big bills. Mm -hmm. the, but there's, there's a whole, there's a whole gamut bunch. of other things. How so, many bills were passed? Uh, there were, hang on, I got my recap sheet here. Uh, we had 79 Senate bills and 89 House bills, which was 19% of the total that were filed. And for a short session, that's, that's pretty average. Not normal. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have you back again next week. We'll talk some more and wrap up the okay. legislation. Thank you very much You're for welcome. coming in. Great to see you. Good to see you. And we look forward to seeing you at the Ireland Parade on, on Sunday, Sunday yes. uh, as long as the rain holds out. Yes. All right, well, you're playing your trumpet. You bet. Thank you for watching WJTS Inform. We are local people watching local people.